far, as you know, we identified increasing collaboration among our laboratories, particularly the ones who weren't uh, having organic collaboration as one of the priorities for our strategic plan. And two years ago, through a lot of effort by many people um, at the center, we formed four clusters in cancer, cardiovascular disease, inflammation, and in obesity. And uh, they've been in existence for two years, and we're going to be hearing from, um, first from the cancer cluster by uh, Dr. Joel Mason, then from the cardiovascular health cluster um, by uh, Dr. Alice Lichtenstein, and from inflammation, immunity, and infectious disease cluster by Dr. Karen Smith, and the obesity cluster by Dr. Susan Roberts. So each of them are going to get, give 10 minutes presentation, and then we'll have five minutes of question and answers, and then they're going to join the students for an hour of free floating conversation. So before I turn the podium to Joel, I want to take this time to thank uh, Dr. Jimmy Pratt and Jose Ordovas, who were the first uh, leaders of the cancer and um, the information meeting for everything they've done so far to get this process going. So thank you very much. Joe? Thanks, Samin. Okay, uh, you'll excuse me if I run rather quickly, but um, we've got a fair bit of territory to cover here. So the cancer cluster uh, actually has representatives, members from 11 different um, laboratories in the uh, Human Nutrition Research Center, as well as the Phoenix Lab over at uh, the Medical Center. Its steering committee consists of six members um, that meet uh, a few times a year, and the group as a whole meets uh, any time, anywhere from uh, one to two times uh, per month. So the theme that the cancer cluster chose to pursue initially when it was first developed a couple of years ago was the interface between the microbiome and uh, cancer risk. And um, I'm going to now present to you three projects that have been underway over the last year and a half um, that have pursued that issue of the interface between microbiome and cancer uh, from different perspectives. Okay, so the uh, first study that uh, was supported and uh, engendered by the cancer cluster um, was one uh, that is being led by Oliver Chen and Ken Rassico from the uh, anti antioxidants lab. And it's an ex vivo incubation study um, that is designed to examine whether uh, proanthocyanidins uh, from cranberries um, are metabolized by the intestinal flora and whether those metabolites um, actually alter the physiology and health of the uh, colonocytes um, um, in, in, the, in the human colon. Um, and the overall design of that study is to actually take the uh, parent proanthocyanidins from cranberries to incubate them in an ex vivo fecal incubator, which is actually a fairly sophisticated little uh, mechanism, um, to then analyze the metabolites uh, of those uh, PACs, um, it's abbreviated PACs, um, and then to take those metabolites and expose them to uh, human uh, colonocytes that are grown out on trans wells. Um, and uh, by doing that, uh, to determine what the effects of these PAC metabolites are on the integrity and the health of the clonic epithelium. So these colonocytes are tweaked with an inflammatory challenge, either with LPS or with IL-1 beta. Um, and um, we are looking at uh, barrier integrity, um, the production of these small peptides that uh, colonocytes use to defend themselves against bacteria, defensins, and so on and so forth, um, and their ability to secrete uh, cytokines themselves. So I'm just going to give you some a taste You'll excuse the use of the word taste. Uh, a, a taste of uh, some of the data that's been uh, generated by this study, but all three of these studies, as you'll see, are ongoing. So I'm just going to be able to give you some of the uh, data that's been generated so far. So this is just an example 
of some of the GC mass spec, mass spec analyses of the metabolites of these um, proanthocyanidins uh, that come from cranberries. Um, and this is a preliminary study that was done in these trans wells of human colonocytes um, looking at their defense and production. And actually all this study shows is that they have to reach confluence before they're really capable of uh, secreting, uh, in this instance, um, human uh, beta defensin, which is uh, one of the major defensins that's secreted by these, um, uh, these epithelial cells. Okay, with that quick run through, I'm going to move on to the next study. And the next study, uh, the leaders are Jimmy Crott and Zhenhua Lu. And this study uh, was designed to examine a very different issue in microbiome and cancer. It's to, looking at obesity-induced colorectal carcinogenesis in an, uh, in an animal model and to examine the interface between obesity, inflammation, the microbiome, and tumorigenesis vis-a-vis two ways of inducing obesity-induced uh, cancer. One is diet-induced obesity, and then comparing that to genetically driven obesity. Okay, um, so um, as indicated here, um, we uh, sought to uh, identify the microbial changes that are associated with intestinal tumorigenesis, and whether it's driven by genetic means or by diet-induced means. Um, and that's what the uh, second uh, objective is here. Now, this group also successfully secured a Tufts Collaborates grant. Uh, there was a number of different uh, people from the HNRC, as well as some of the bioinformatics people over at the medical center that were on this grant. And it essentially was designed to incorporate the metabolome. So not only, are, uh, not only is this study uh, looking at the microbiome, and uh, not only is it also looking at the transcriptome of what's going on in terms of uh, genomic uh, expression uh, in, the, in the intestine, but it's now also incorporating the metabolome as well. And, of course, those are huge databases, which is why we need uh, as much bioinformatics assistance as possible. Okay, so the, main, the design of the study uh, is what you see here. Um, it basically compared uh, wild-type animals on a low-fat diet versus an animal that is genetically driven to develop uh, intestinal tumors, the APC1638 animal, either on a low- or high-fat diet, and comparing that to a genetically driven obese animal, the DBDB animal, uh, which we crossed with the APC1638 animal, so it also had an inclination to go ahead and develop intestinal tumors. Okay, so I'm just going to give you a little bit of taste of data from this study. Uh, we made animals obese uh, either through uh, diet-induced obesity, as you see here, or even more so uh, in the DBDB animals. Those of you who have worked with DBDB animals know that they get very big very quickly. Okay, so this is uh, the tumorigenesis data, and uh, regardless of what metric you use to measure um, um, inclination towards tumorigenesis. You can see that the animals that were uh, obese from a uh, diet-induced um, uh, mechanism um, clearly had uh, more tumorigenesis than the animals who were on the low-fat diet, who were lean animals. And uh, that was even more so amongst those animals that were DBDB animals. Okay, in terms of the microbiome, if you look at the um, differences in the microbiome, and this is just an example of where I'm comparing the microbiome in two obese categories, either genetically driven obesity or diet-induced obesity. We have comparisons for all the other kind of um, arms as well, but I'm just giving this as an example. If you look at a phylum level, the, the differences really aren't that impressive. But if you look a little bit deeper in terms of identifying the bacteria on a, a family level or genus level or species level using this operational units uh, type of um, categorization, 
you can see that the genetically driven obesity has a really remarkably different micro, uh, microbiome profile than uh, the diet-induced obesity. And so uh, this is turning out to be very interesting and is really one of the first comparisons of driving obesity from those two uh, uh, means. Um, as I mentioned, the Tufts Collaborates grant has also given us the opportunity to look at this uh, from the metabolome uh, perspective. And this is, again, just one example of a huge database on uh, metabolomics that we have now. And I'll just point out uh, these kind of interesting observations in glycine metabolism. And I'll point your attention to sarcosine here, which goes up in an incremental fashion uh, in, in, in parallel with the um, inclination towards tumorigenesis. And actually, this has been observed uh, by other investigate, at least by one other investigative group, um, both in humans as well as in animals, that sarcosine levels go up in the colon uh, with uh, tumorigenesis. Um, and there's some interesting parallel uh, changes in some of these other glycine metabolites that are also occurring in conjunction with sarcosine. Okay, um, the last study that I'm going to go over is um, the one that is being led by Zhang Dong Wang, and this is another animal study. And this was looking at uh, the role of inflammation and hepatocellular car uh, um, diet induced obesity uh, inducing inflammation and thereby inducing hepatocellular carcinogenesis and the role that um, the microbiome uh, plays in that. So the, the underlying hypothesis of this study was that attenuation of uh, diet-induced uh, uh, inflammation um, by uh, knocking out the uh, TPL2 gene would reduce the appearance of neoplastic lesions um, in the liver, uh, again, that were induced by the consumption of a high-fat diet. And so this was a uh, rather complicated uh, protocol with, uh, what, eight different arms um, using either wild-type mice or TPL2 knockout mice um, that um, um, were then either placed on a low-fat diet or a high-fat diet and either got sham injections or were tweaked with DEN, which is this um, alkylating agent that uh, induces hepatocellular carcinogenesis in mice. Now, we don't have uh, many results from this study yet. Uh, the animals have all been sacked, and uh, all the tissues are in the uh, freezer, but um, I um, don't have much in the way of data to present to you uh, on this particular study. So that's a relatively, or I would say a very rapid run-through. Am I still doing okay on time? Wow, I am. Maybe I should go back and blab some more. Oh, it's, I'm sorry. John's telling me I have zero time left. Okay, anyways, those are the projects that are uh, going on right now. Uh, we, I, I think you would agree that we have some very exciting data, um, even though these projects aren't entirely done. And we actually have an upcoming meeting to decide where we're going to take these observations to the next level. What's the next series of studies and what are the grants and what are the papers we're going to write uh, pertaining to uh, what we've already observed. And I guess I'll take questions later after all the other talks are done. You have five minutes. Oh, I have five minutes. So are there any questions? Yeah, so we, so, um, we use the APC1638 animal, which develops most of its tumors in the small intestine, which is a uh, you know, problem with this model, as is true of almost every genetically driven uh, animal model of intestinal tumorigenesis. Now, we, uh, Jimmy recently developed a new animal model of uh, colon carcinogenesis, where the tumors are entirely in the colon. And um, um, so th this model has its limitations like uh, any animal model of intestinal tumorigenesis. Yeah? Did you try to look on, uh, with a different system if there is increased rate of turnover of enterocytes? And also hepatocytes which could give rise to the tumor and if 
you're looking also at the river and the large vessels. Well, you know, amongst the endpoints are um, measures of proliferation in these tissues, which I don't think we have the data on in uh, either study yet. Um, but um, I think, as far as I know, right now, that's the only measure of turnover is, is proliferation rate and a apoptosis rates, um, which we can measure pretty readily in these using quantitative immunohistochemistry. I don't know. Zhang, are you here? Is, is, um, I, I don't know what Zhang's using in terms of looking at proliferation. I, I mean, he can also measure um, proliferation using things like KI-67 in the um, liver, but I'm not sure what else he has uh, planned in regard to turnover. Okay. Sai? Last Right. Do you think you could sort of, you know, start out with humans as their human studies or using it as a signature for like almost like a screener or customizing the engine set, sort of being able to use that in some ways to identify those that have a signature for the kind of, you know, the diagnosis we see versus? Well, I think, first of all, there already are human studies that have kind of identified, that have begun to... Can you use that as sort of a screening profile? Identify new uh, you mean whether they're predisposed to developing ob obesity? It's an interesting question, and I have no idea whether or not you'd, a microbiome would necessarily be predictive in that regard. I mean, it, it's it's a question that we could e easily ask if we start, you know, if and when we start doing the human studies, um, and it's a question that should be addressed. But I don't know what the answer is. Okay, well, what I'm going to do is first um, review a little bit about the cardiovascular cluster, and then I'll tell you what we've been doing. So as far as the cardiovascular cluster goes, initially um, we set out goals for ourselves, and the first was to foster inter-HNRCA laboratory collaboration that transcended the current projects, which I think we've done to a certain extent, um, expand the scope of knowledge in the area of cardiovascular health by pooling collective expertise, and uh, facilitate continued growth as far as cluster members in terms of the area. And I think that we're, we're slowly addressing those um, issues. Um, early on, and this occurred during the first um, retreat that was focused on clusters, the cluster decided that the focus was going to be on diet, satin and interactions. And th there were a number of reasons for this. Um, one is that the current recommendations now are for lifestyle modification to reduce cardiovascular disease risk. However, an extremely high proportion of the U.S. population is now on statins. So, um, and thinking about it, there wasn't that that was a, a much that's actually been done to address the potential um, interaction between diet and statin therapy. Um, just to get, put it in perspective, according to the CDC, there's been a dramatic increase in the use of statins over tenfold. And for individuals age 45 and older, or, um, the, incre the increase actually um, was between 2% and 25% as far as two waves of the NHANES data, but for those individuals that we focus on at this center, those that are 65 and older, the increase was actually from 25 percent to about half of the population. Um, the cardiovascular health cluster has three components to it, and we meet twice a month, except in the summer, and we've really organized projects around those three um, 
those three segments. So the first segment actually was something that was more unifying. It had to do with writing a literature review in the area of diet and um, statin use. And that there were none that were identified. Um, we involved a lot of members, um, some of whom are no longer at the center, some of whom are involved in the cluster, some of whom aren't involved in the cluster. And that manuscript is actually in review. And for any other cluster that um, decides they're going to write one large review, talk to us because we could give you a few, a few pointers on it. Um, as far as our subgroups go, we have the population epidemiolog epidemiology cluster. And what was chosen um, for the focus had to do with statin use and the potential interaction with whole grains on the basis of the NHANES data. And that was led by uh, Hu Fen Wang. And essentially what we found is that um, from the NHANES, as I said previously, 25% um, of the individuals above the age of 45 were statin users. Um, of them, 31% consumed at least 16 grams of whole grains per day, which is the equivalent of one serving and far below what the current dietary guidelines are recommending. Um, however, if you divided those individuals who were consuming more or less whole grains, it turns out, and also <coughs> either took statins or didn't take statins, it turns out there was actually a significant difference in non-HDL cholesterol and um, total to HDL ratio. The lower the ratio, the better. The reason we looked at non-HDL is because um, for NHANES, the samples aren't always fasting, so you can't calculate an LDL value, so you calculate a non-HDL value. Um, and as indicated, the difference was greater um, in those individuals that consume more whole grains in terms of lower levels of non-HDL um, which was 31 milligrams per deciliter versus 20 milligrams per deciliter. Now, why this, we observe this, it's unclear. It may be that statins or whole grain impacts on the pharmacokinetics of statins, either um, decreasing rate of absorption, potentially potentiating the rate because if it decreases it, then it gets released more, um, more slowly or that there may be just other factors that are different between the diets of individuals who consume whole grains versus don't consume whole grains, which also could have an impact on statin kinetics. The next um, project had to do with the clinical interventional study group, and this was proposed as a um, ancillary study to the General Mills study, and this was led by Molson Madani. And it also involved um, David Greenblatt as a collaborator from Tufts Medical Center. And what the initial thinking was, well, since it wasn't an exclusion um, as to whether individuals who were recruited for the General Mills study, which focused on whole grains, um, whether they were on statins or weren't on statins, we thought, well, We'll have two groups of individuals, and we will be able to see whether under control conditions where the isolated variable is whole grains, whether that would impact on the pharmacokinetics of statins and may impact things like um, whether you would um, increase or decrease statin dose on the basis of certain dietary variables. Unfortunately, what we found is that not that many people who are taking statins actually volunteered for the study. However, we are hoping, since the recruitment is still ongoing, that we ultimately have enough statistical power to address that issue. Um, where I'm going to spend most of my time has to do with the animal study. And this has to do with the trial of Osibo pigs and really being able now to look at diet versus statin interaction in a very controlled way. And this involves a lot of individuals from the um, cardiovascular health cluster, but also a lot of individuals at the center because we did hold a center-wide meeting, said we are going to be doing this study, we are going to have lots of uh, material, essentially, what do you want? Plus, we also have two collaborators, Dr. Joseph Urban and Dr. Gloria Solano um, Ag Aguirre, who um, are at the, um, the center in Beltsville that have been working very closely with us. So a little bit of background about the Asibo pig and why we decided to use the pig. Um, 
we know that, again, as I've mentioned, there's a dearth of data in this area, but this is in particularly in terms of the additive, complementary, and adverse effects. Um, if they're complementary or ad additive effects, then as far as drug um, diet interaction, the dosage could actually be lowered. And the reason that this um, could potentially have public health significance is because it could lower drug um, costs, health care costs, if the um, dosage was lowered. And it could also impact on um, compliance, which is a very big problem with um, the use of statin drugs. Uh, Rodents are very poor models for cardiovascular disease. You've probably never seen a mouse go, oh, oh, you know, heart, heart attack. Uh, that's because mice have very high levels of HDL, so they're protected. Um, pigs actually have a, a pathogenesis uh, relatively similar to humans in terms of lipoproteins, inflammatory markers, and also morphology of the architecture of the um, vessel lesion. Um, the Asaba pig developed hypercholesteremia and also the metabolic syndrome, very similar to humans in response to diet. Um, if anyone's wondering, this is what an Asaba pig looks like. This is a young Asaba pig. This is an older one. Um, if you remember the criteria for metabolic syndrome, um, increased waist circumference, which that pig has, <laughs> and then hypertension, hyperglycemia, um, dyslipidemia. Um, so the study is designed, it's a four by four design, or two by two by design, where we have a heart healthy diet, an atherogenic diet, either on statins or off statins. Um, this slide is very busy and I do need to speed up my, the way I talk, so I'm just going to um, point out that the atherogenic diet is high in saturated fat, low in polys. Um, they do get, uh, the heart healthy diet gets fish oil. Um, the heart healthy diet is lower in refined grain, higher in whole grain. I have the fruit and vegetable concentrate highlighted because I'll tell you a little bit about that. The cholesterol is lower in the heart healthy diet and they do get a torvastatin, a statin. If you're wondering how you give pigs fish oil capsules and a statin, you put it in a little bit of cookie dough and you give it to them in the morning before they eat and they happily consume it. Now, obviously for a heart healthy diet, what we want to do is give them a lot of fruits and vegetables. Pigs notoriously eat almost anything. However, the diet has to be made up in batches and it has to be very stable and you can't do that with fruits and vegetables. So we did identify um, a freeze dried preparation of fruits and vegetables. It's got a very <coughs> wide range of fruits and vegetables, some of which we don't normally consume. But anyway, um, that, that's why we're taking that approach. This is the design of the study that we have blood draws monthly. It's a six month intervention. Um, statin pharmacokinetics are done three times during the study every other month and then these pigs are going to get two DEXs and then obviously sacrifice at the end. If, um, sometimes they're referred to as a hog. If you're wondering what the difference between a pig and a hog is, I now have found that out. A pig is younger, a hog is older unless you're in um, England where they're all hogs. Um, now, this has had a somewhat of a circuitous, this um, project, circuitous route. It was originally funded in the spring of 2013. There were some administrative um, challenges that we had to address in order to get the funding transferred to the Beltsville facility. Uh, Beltsville wanted to start the study very quickly. Initially, they, would have they had suggested we use the uh, domestic pig as opposed to the Asaba pig, which we were interested in. So they actually had started a group of pigs, but they got too big and we still hadn't um, um, figured out how to transfer the funds. Um, they then started a second group and we still were having problems with that. Um, I should also say that Stefania Lamon Fava and um, Nirupa Bartan, Martan are really the um, leaders of this project. I sort of said that at the beginning. At any rate, finally, we made a joint decision to switch to the Asabo pig, which meant further delay, but I think it works out better for everyone who's going to be getting tissue. Um, there is only one place to get Asaba pigs. It's at the Indiana um, University School of Medicine, Purdue University breeding colony. And unfortunately, our first attempts to breed the pigs were unsuccessful. However, we now have two groups of mothers that have been bred. We're hoping for a good outcome. We're 
looking forward to births in the summer of 2014. If I can, I'm going to get pictures and I'll send it out to all you collaborators. And um, the animals will be sacrificed in spring of 2015. I think that we learned a lot from this. It's not always easy to have cross-institutional collaborations, but it can work. And sometimes you just have to spend some time doing that. Um, we future, we are um, working on publishing the, both the review and the first manuscript. Um, we hope to recruit that enough um, people be recruited for the General Mills study. Um, we have plans, as you can see now, to sack the uh, Asaba pigs and then to distribute the sample to our collaborators. A recent email went out updating them on stat. To see if anyone is interested in the um, in samples from the Asaba pig study, please let me know. We've got certain areas that um, Beltsville has expressed an interest in that has to do with the microbiome, but there's a lot of material we can get from the pigs. What we're trying to do is make sure there's no in, uh, overlap and provide samples um, to all the labs in a, in a way that they can can um, use them and get the most out of them. And, you know, we're looking forward to additional, um, additional projects. Um, at this point, these are the most active members on the cluster. We're a small cluster, but an active cluster. We're always looking for additional people to become involved. And if I've forgotten anybody, I do appreciate it. I do. Uh, yes, I do. Um, what do you, I do, you know. <laughs> I apologize, yes. Got a little bit flustered there, but hopefully I didn't, um, I didn't forget anyone. So with that, any questions? Yeah, time for one question. Thank you so much. <laughs> Your promise will be short. What about the information you said? As far as the Asaba pig? You know, the effect. Oh, inflammatory factors. How about improving information? Well, we're all looking at that in the Asaba pig study that will have the higher whole grain. We're actually hoping somebody else will become interested in uh, probing more with the NHANES data to address the issue of inflammation. The NHANES also yeah. They do. Yeah, they do. At, but um, the person who was working on that project is no longer at the HNRCA, so we're actually hoping somebody else becomes interested in it. Thank you, Samin. So I'll be talking today on behalf of the Inflammation, Immunity, and Infectious Disease Cluster, and I've organized my talk around these five questions. First, why study inflammation? How is inflammation related to food? Who is in the inflammation cluster? What has the cluster been doing? And where is the cluster going in the future? So the first question, why study inflammation? There are two main responses to this question. One is that inflammation is a contributor to most of the chronic diseases that we study at the HNRC, and these diseases are listed here. This is a subset of them. The other response is that by targeting inflammation as opposed to just one disease, there's the potential that we'll address many problems at once. And so this is one of our, our goals. The next question in one slide, how is inflammation related to food? This example of cruciferous vegetables is one of over 10,000 papers in PubMed related to the amelioration of inflammation or protection that's conferred by foods. And if you look at, further at those papers, of the 10,000 papers, nearly half of them have some component of aging. And that's something else that we care deeply about. I'll also mention that in this, in this study, this is the Shanghai Woman's study, they were looking at cruciferous vegetables 
and they reported that the median intake was just under a cup a day. So I think that we have a long way to go in the U.S. to kind of catch up with that. In response to the question, who is in the inflammation cluster as of the spring 2014, this is a list of people, and they're color-coded by lab or by interest group. So you see we have a very diverse group of people in the inflammation cluster. And this was a, a tremendous strength, but it was also something that was challenging, particularly at the beginning of the cluster. So I had the question stated, what has the cluster been doing? But the real question was, how do we find a project that engages all of the diverse members of our cluster? You know, finding a single project was very difficult for us. Uh, fortunately, Jose inspired us, and his idea was that we would develop a systems-based approach to understanding how nutrition can be used to prevent inflammation and in the diseases related to inflammation. So our goal was to generate new and testable hypotheses by capturing relationships between nutrition, very broadly defined, this could be foods, it could be dietary macronutrients, could be patterns, and the aspect of aging for the outcome of inflammatory biomarkers. The project that we envisioned was called the Nutri Interactome, or even longer, the Nutrition Inflammation Interaction Network, and a major builder of the Interactome as well as some of the slides I'll be using, is Larry Parnell. So this is a picture of the first version of the Nutri Interactome, or the Nutrition Inflammation Interaction Network. And it looks very nice, but what is it telling us, and how do we generate hypotheses from this? So I think to help answer that question, we can take a more conceptual view of the Nutri Interactome database. And each node represents either an exposure. Exposure is something like a nutrient, a small molecule, a dietary pattern, and an outcome, which is an inflammatory biomarker in general. There are also links connecting those nodes, which are indicating relationships between the exposures and the outcomes. So we may have an exposure of saturated fats. We may have an outcome of CRP. And the link may be increase or decrease. But how do we use the Nutri Interactome to generate new hypotheses? In the very short time that we have here, I can't talk too much about methods, but I can say that hypotheses emerge through an iterative process of data visualization and data interpretation. And if we take a, a more concrete view, it may be easier to see what we're doing. The objective of this project was to identify biological overlaps between the Mediterranean diet and statin drugs for the outcome of inflammation. And as Alice has already mentioned, we were fortunate that the cardiovascular cluster was working on a project already to look at food modulation of statin response. So we were able to draw genes from that project. We were also able to draw a large amount of data from proteomics and genomics databases and draw on the published literature for Mediterranean diet and statin or an inflammation. And there's a considerable literature for that. This is a, a project that has been conducted by Summer Howe with the help of Larry. And they used Cytoscape software to create that visualization and interpretation, the iterative process. What they ended up with, some of the products of that process, were two subnetworks. The one on the left representing entities related to Mediterranean diet, and the one on the right representing response to statins. And what we see in the middle is a set of inflammatory biomarkers. And these could be targeted either by the diet or by the statin drugs. So things like CRP, VCAM1, TNF-alpha, IL-6, adiponectin. And when we try to figure out you know, what these two treatments have in common, what we found was that two genes stood out. There are two genes that overlap. It's a little bit hard to read, but these are NR4A2 and LPA. And if we take a closer look at just one of those genes, NR4A2 is a member of a family of ligand-dependent transcription factors that regulate metabolism 
in a tissue-specific manner. It's a gene that responds to many stimuli, so fatty acids, glucose, insulin, cholesterol, and these potentially suggest a, a dietary connection. This locus is also associated with vascular lesion formation in a mouse model. So this is, this is a, an outcome that's related to inflammation and has important implications for humans. The locus also responds to phenol-rich olive oil inter, uh, intervention in that it decreases expression in response to PBMCs. And finally, there is evidence of circadian control at the locus. And that's always of interest to us because we've seen that the connections between circadian biology and metabolism often very tight and often very informative. So we then set out to investigate the hypothesis that genetic variants of NR4A2 are associated with inflammation. And we looked at a human population called the golden population. It's a, it's a group that we've looked at over the years. They're very typical of, of people in the U.S., overweight, a uh, fair number have metabolic syndrome, a fair number have hypertriglyceridemia. So this work was conducted by Summer Howe again, with help from Lara uh, Chow. And she, the work is in progress, but she's already found preliminary associations between variants at this locus and the kinds of outcomes that we're interested in. She's also seen relationships between dietary factors and the modulation of those genetic associations. We refer to those as dietary interactions. And she's reported interactions for total fat, monounsaturated fat, polyunsaturated fat, uh, N3-PUFA, and also alcohol. So this represents a promising locus that we otherwise wouldn't have been looking at now. And it, it's possible we never would have looked at it at all. The last question, where is the inflammation cluster going in the future, really generates three more questions. Um, one, who will work with the inflammation cluster in the future? And clearly members of other clusters have begun to work with the inflammation cluster. Um, we're, we're fortunate that the collaboration with the cardiovascular health cluster has begun. That's been informative. We have students from the Friedman School working with us. But we imagine that Sackler students and computer science students will also be joining this, this project. In terms of new processes, we are, imagine the creation of a nutri-immunogenomics practicum. We're also going to create a lot more big words that are hard to say when you're presenting. That's a specialty. Um, students would partner with the lab of their choice, but they would also have a computational component working with the nutri-interactome platform. So students are gaining familiarity not only with uh, primary literature and these databases, but they're also learning about uh, database programming, network biology, system biology. We'll continue to generate testable hypotheses. These could be for grant proposals or for pilot projects. And we also imagine that a training grant proposal could come up in the, in the field of computational biology. So with that, I'll just uh, thank everyone who's been involved with the cluster, either in the past, the present, or the future. Um, this is the same list that you saw earlier, but I've indicated the students in red uh, because we, we feel that students are a really important part of the future of this cluster. And thank you all for coming. So this morning I discovered that all of John's emails to me all year have been going into my junk folder, and so I was, uh, if I sound unprepared, that's because I didn't know till this morning I was supposed to be doing this, and I apologize for that. It's a, it's a lesson in uh, email management. I was actually pleased that the administration wasn't sending me so many emails. But, uh, <laughs> so. Um, we took, I mean, it's kind of interesting to see the different approaches that all of the clusters have taken. Um, for the obesity cluster, which has been co-chaired by Andy Greenberg and I, uh, the first decision we made was that, 
you know, since none of us had really collaborated before, even though we'd had the opportunity to, um, we would spend the first year talking. And we didn't propose any research in the first year. It was really a question of meetings and chatting and seeing what we could do. And subsequent to that, we decided what we were really interested in with money. And so we've been putting quite a lot of emphasis on, rather than, rather than you know, kind of plunging straight into research, thinking about how we could leverage existing projects um, that we've been doing to start writing grants that would be more collaborative than they previously would. We're, we're a small cluster. We have five or six um, HNRC labs who, who are really part of this sphere. We do have meetings. We also have quite a lot of informal office visits and, and chats. So this is where we are um, today. I'll, I'll talk about the significance of those stars on the graph in a minute. This is not working. What did you do? This side here. Um, okay. Um, the original conception of the obesity cluster, which we called um, from obesity to health, was that there were three distinct areas that we might um, delve into and talk about, nutrient requirements of the obese, novel mechanisms, and clinical interventions worldwide. We've been primarily focusing on uh, clinical interventions. That's the one I'm going to be talking to you about, just because there's a lot of opportunities there. Um, for the collaborative work that we want to do. Um, collaborations, in our view, given that we're a small cluster, are things that involve at least two labs. Um, many of us are interested in obesity as a worldwide phenomenon. Um, the interesting thing here, I think, is that you know, we, we, we're very used to the American obesity statistics, 69% overweight or obese in the adult population. But we're actually, you know, not the worst at all. If you look at the numbers, Germany has 81%, Ireland has 75 Egypt has um, 77 So we have a bad problem, but it, we're actually not the worst one out there. The disease burdens obviously are catastrophic. They're going to be particularly catastrophic for countries with poor health um, treatment options. Um, I was just back from West Africa and they're just starting to see obesity in the villages now. And the thought of having diabetes in a village where there's mud streets, uh, you know, I can't imagine how they're going to deal with all their amputations, for example. Um, obesity shows no sign of improving anywhere in the world. Um, here's where we, as we see our um, progression, if you like, the combinations of, of meetings and mentoring for the, jun uh, for the junior students in our departments who are interested in obesity uh, discussions and emerging collaborative projects, moving on to writing grants and collaborative research. So if you like, there's no kind of small projects in here almost. We're trying to skip fairly, fairly aggressively into grant writing. Um, the clinical intervention subcluster. Um, here's our progress so far. We, uh, we have one application to the Department of Defense looking at uh, comparing different behavioral interventions for preventing weight regain. We've had an official co confirmation that we're going to be receiving that next week. Um, we've been having an unofficial confirmation that it was funded since last December and you know, every time we talk to them, say, oh, yes, it's just signed off on my desk. I've passed it to something. They have many desks, but we've been actually given a date, which is very exciting. Um, we think we have a better mousetrap in terms of a behavioral intervention to standard of care, but the only way we can really tell whether that's true is to put it back to back with the, with the best thing out there, which is something like the Diabetes Prevention Program intervention, which prevents the, uh, prevents the progression of, of um, pre-diabetes to diabetes very effectively, um, including cardiometabolic outcomes with collaborators like Alice, asking whether there's a ripple effect of behavioral interventions in, in adult um, 
participants to other adults within the um, family and also to their children. Um, collaborators Robert Stas, Lichtenstein Feldman, and Tasso Peters. So that's, that's an application that was submitted last year and we hope to be starting very shortly. We also submitted an NIH grant in 2013 again to compare different behavioral interventions but with a somewhat different focus, looking again at the sustainability of weight loss and cardiometabolic health, but also looking at healthcare costs because um, the average obese person's healthcare cost, defining obesity just as a BMI over um, 30, is an average of $2,800 a year more than that of a lean person. Um, healthcare costs start to rise at a BMI of 27. The, um, if you just take everybody with a BMI of 27 and over, their average healthcare costs are about $600 more than a lean person. That shoots up to about $5,000 per person more when they have any diagnosis like um, uh, lipids, um, hypertension, diabetes, any of those. So the, the question of whether you can actually improve healthcare costs if you improve weight is an open issue right now. There have actually been no studies that have been successfully conducted conducted that have both managed to induce clinically significant weight loss in the population and measured healthcare cost changes. There have been you know, some studies that have measured healthcare cost changes when their interventions failed and they didn't manage to produce weight loss. And there's been some other studies that produced weight loss but didn't include a healthcare cost analysis. Um, this would be the first stock uh, study to hopefully merge those two. Um, that will not happen for a while because we need, we need to resubmit that. Uh, okay, so the other, the other um, exciting thing that we've been doing part of the cluster is we have developed an international obesity consortium. And that's the, uh, that was the significance of the stars on the, uh, on the first graph. Um, because obesity is a, an international phenomenon We've decided to put together multiple investigators from all studies in the, in the first instance to get cross-sectional data on energy metabolism and eating behavior. 